Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we'll start with the presentations in just a few minutes. Please be patient. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are going to start in some few minutes. So we will wait. Uh, there are only 66 persons in this Zoom meeting, and we are more than that. Okay, let's see if you can configure it first. Perfect. Hello everyone, one church is here. <laughs> we had a little bit uh, of a delay in the training, but uh, the other two churches are arriving in a minute, I guess. Sorry for that. Yeah, exactly. They are about to join. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Ines. Hi, nice to meet me. No worries. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we will have to. Español nos hemos rellenar. We are waiting for the other judges, and we are preparing the slides. So, at first place, thank you all for your commitment, for your engagement. This was an an awesome um, weekend. I think at 
maybe some teams will be receiving some prize and that stuff, but I think all of you are winners. You are here. You were selected for a lot of people from all around the world. And the most important thing is all of you had so great ideas and you engage with people from other parts of Latin America or other parts of the world. You engage with, you engage it, engage it <laughs> with uh, mentors for, from a lot of part with very different knowledge and backgrounds. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, that's the price, the, the opportunity, the network, uh, and, and feel, and, and if you really think that your solution is a great idea, don't be uh, shy, don't, don't think this is the end, try to develop it, and the post hackathon will be for that. Uh, this event don't end here. It will be. It will. It will continue some months more to really help you to develop your solution. So, thank you all, and we will start in a few minutes. Now we have Eduardo. Maybe Ines, uh, can you introduce yourself? And also Eduardo, can you introduce yourself? For... Sorry to interrupt, Ines. Uh, oh. We also have Irene. So we are all set with with the judges. Oh. Okay, uh, and let me just before you introduce yourself, uh, let me share my screen to start with the actual slide deck. Just a few seconds, please. Are you able to see them now? Yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, so as, as Benjamin was saying, uh, we welcome you to these final presentations and we thank you so much for all the, the hard effort you, you've been putting in, in, in this work. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I personally had the, the chance to interact with some of you this morning and I, I'm aware of the of really the hard work that you've been putting in this. Uh, we really appreciate it and we wish you the best of the luck. Uh, you are in this last stage and you made it to this last stage because you deserve it. Uh, don't, don't hesitate uh, uh, to, to do your best. Please try to do your best and well, welcome again. So uh, I think we already have this introduction. And uh, now it's time, please. Uh, Ines, I think you were about to introduce yourself. If you can introduce yourself to the participants, please. Okay, I do. So, hi, I'm Ines. I'm a Swiss, but I'm living in Sao Paulo, Brazil for about 10 years now. I'm actually working in a health tech startup, which is creating conversational uh, chatbots, AI based uh, chatbots for um, monitoring and evo evaluating mental health data of big populations. And when the COVID outbreak occurred, we um, developed together with the Ministry of Health a pre-screening of symptoms and Q&A um, chatbot. And uh, as a sequence after that, we developed a program for frontline health workers because they're very under impact of um, stress and, and um, burnout risk. And we're um, always um, responding a lot to what is going on at the moment in um, the health field in Brazil. So I'm very excited. I'm very nervous as well. So you're not the only ones. <laughs> who, I'm nervous to have to judge all those uh, beautiful projects. And I'm, I'm afraid that I won't be able to choose the best one <laughs> because they will be amazing, all of them, I'm sure. Um, should I go should on? I, <laughs> should I present myself? Please. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm Eduardo. I did the opposite movement, movement of Ines. I, I'm actually Brazilian. I'm living outside now. I'm living in the US. I'm currently a behavioral scientist at the behavioral, uh, behavioral scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, trying to come up with public policies that are more efficient in a way. Um, and relate more to people's needs. And uh, well, congratulations for arriving uh, to this stage again. I 
participated in hackathons as a participant, as a mentor, as a judge, and all the positions. And I know how, how stressful and, and rewarding it is at the same time. So, well, congratulations. And I'm uh, really much looking forward to, to, to seeing uh, what you have to show us. Hello Thanks everyone, everyone and I'm Irene, Irene Arias. I'm the CEO of IDB Lab. It's the innovation lab of the Inter-American Development Bank uh, Group. Um, I have mostly a finance background, so it was only uh, recently that I got into understanding better how to digitize health and, and some of the solutions that are needed now uh, as we just run a, a challenge ourselves. Um, but uh, like Ines, um, equally nervous to see, uh, you know, to be able to do a good job today with you uh, because I, I'm, I'm sure the proposal is going to be great. Uh, so very much looking forward to it. Thanks, Irene. You? Yeah. So uh, do you want to continue, Benjamin, or do you want me to... No, take the, uh, take the lead, please. Okay, so with this, we are now gonna turn to, well, first, a uh, brief introduction. I know that this has been repeated a lot. Uh, we're just gonna summarize uh, the, the process that you've been working on. As you know, uh, you started on Friday by pitching yourselves, by creating teams. Uh, we really appreciate the effort that you made in, in, in doing those teams, either by Slack, uh, by Zoom, by WhatsApp. You, you, found a lot of ways in order to create teams, to mix uh, yourselves uh, and to get to know each other and to start working, uh, to start hacking actually. Uh, then uh, between yesterday and tomorrow, we provided you with uh, some meetings in order to, to give you feedback, as much feedback as possible. Uh, I, I hope that this feedback was useful for you. Uh, and then, well, in these last couple of hours, you've been inter iterating a lot. Uh, you've been preparing your slides, and finally, you're here to present. Uh, I hope you all are ready to present. Uh, now, I'm going to uh, mention a little bit about the judging criteria. Uh, this is also information that you have and that you read on the, on the participants' guide since the first day. But just for you to be aware and for the judges to remember, there are four uh, main guides guidelines that uh, they are going to take into account. The first one is the impact. If the solution is really uh, solving a real problem, if it has potential for a widespread public health impact, if it addresses the important challenge identified in the prompt. Uh, then the, the second one is innovation. How, how innovative uh, your idea uh, is, and judges are going to try to, to guess that by your pitching. So please try to emphasize this as well. The third uh, uh, criterion is implementation. Uh, could the proof of concept prototype or preliminary vision be executed upon? Is it sustainable, viable, and feasible? Uh, I know that you all prepared, uh, some of you prepared uh, business models, uh, proof of concept, so please also try to emphasize this as well. And the fourth one is the presentation overall, like uh, how effective was the presentation, uh, I know that there might be some uh, technical problems during the presentation, but please don't stop. Uh, you will have three, just three minutes to, uh, and here are the, the logistics. You, you'll have just three minutes to present. If you have any technical issue, uh, if you feel like that you missed uh, any idea, please go ahead because we will be quite strict. I know that during the feedback sessions we were not, but we will be uh, very strict in this final presentation. So you will have just three minutes to present. That will be followed by two minutes of Q&A by our judges. And uh, then, uh, well, the presentation is random. We've decided the order through a random sample. Uh, we will let you know, uh, and you will notice in, in the next slides, we will uh, announce, for example, uh, we'll start with team two. Uh, and that same slide will mention you uh, that the next team to present is team eight. So you will have around five minutes, the next team to present, to prepare yourself. Uh, so please be, be, pay attention to all this. And the process is that um, you should raise your hand. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask the questions. Uh, Benjamin and uh, Francis, Francesca and I will try to answer your questions. Uh, then uh, it, please, all, all of you should remain muted. Uh, 
you will be allowed to to talk when you when it's your turn to present so please if you you should have already decided if only one person of the team is going to present if two people of the team are going to present so please raise your hand the one two or three people that are going to present because that will allow us to know who's presenting and we will uh, unmute those people in order to start presenting that will be followed up by what i've already mentioned the three minutes followed by the two minutes of q a and with that uh i think we we are ready to to start with this presentation let me just um do a couple of things here i don't know if a uh, benjamin the judges or francisca do you have any other comment before starting with the actual presentations i no, only that we will be very hard with the time, so you need to um, do your bit in three minutes. Remember that, please. Yeah, please remember that. Okay, so uh, with that, um, we will start with team 19, which is called Optimizers, and we will then, that, that team will then be followed up by team 31, which is called Universal Health Record. Uh, so. Team 19, uh, can you please let us know who's gonna present by raising your hand? Okay, so I can see Esther, uh, and I guess it's just you. Uh, I will unmute, un unmute yourself. I I'm not gonna repeat this in process for the, for the following teams, but I'm trying to emphasize this for the first, first team. I'm gonna unmute yourself. Please feel free to share your, your, your camera, if, if you will to. So you, you are okay. unmuted, Esther, and your time, starts uh, in three, two, one, now. Okay, I can see the, okay. Next slide, please. Healthcare centers present the highest risk for COVID-19 infection. But waiting times for medical care range from 90 minutes to four hours. It's no surprise patients are afraid to seek care. But you didn't know that 70% of that time is spent on paperwork and waiting and not on delivering healthcare? Next slide. Why should people spend that much time being exposed to COVID if we can make sure they are in and out of medical facilities in a, heart, in a heartbeat? Next slide, please. They shouldn't. And then slide be patient here. Be patient uses surveys for triage and ambulatory care patients before they even get to the facility. With that, we reduce the paperwork and improve patient flow. Minimize exposure to COVID while making sure patients still get the attention they need. I master. I'm a medical student from Brazil, and I'm seeking to help turn those public outpatient facilities to the safest and most efficient versions of themselves. But how does it work? If the patient needs emergency attention, they can find a public AR near them and answer a quick survey. Next slide. These answers are used to triage them into four colors based on established urgency protocols. From low to high risk, we have blue, green, yellow, and red. The patient survey answers and risk classification are sent to the facility information system so that the staff is ready to provide the care the patient needs with the urgency that is demanded. Next slide. For those who seek no urgent care, with a more detailed survey, we identify the type of attention they need and guide them on the best way to reach that care. If they do require in-person services, our system matches the patient with a date and time the nearest primary care facility, giving them information on everything they need for the appointment. Next slide. But what about those with no internet access? For that, we work alongside local governments and NGOs to ensure all public health care facilities have tablets available so patients can fill the surveys as soon as they get there using UV light devices to clean the tablets between users. Next slide. Why is our app important? By focusing on public medical care, we will positively impact up to 9% of the population in Latin American countries, cutting an average of one hour of unnecessary exposure time. Next slide. Our next steps include reaching out to the local health government and nonprofits, starting in Salvador, where I live, to work with them in training and testing our app in outpatient facilities. From then on, our app will keep being improved until we can reach all Latin America. We also work on improving our trial system and accessibility, making it easier and easier for all kinds of patients to use it, from blind people to elders. Next slide. We are be patient a team of diverse people reaching for one goal, improving the public health system. Next slide. If we win, we will revolutionize public health patient care while saving time, resources, and lives. Thank you. Hi. Just on time, that's great. Thanks, team. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Irene was asking what was the yes, number? Yes, I got it, 19. Oh, Thank okay, you. That's yeah, yeah, several responded. Uh, can I shoot a question? Uh, yes. We're All right. start with questions. So um, one of the criteria that we use, which has, uh, is related to impact, is, uh, uh, is this reusing and improving or optimizing existing solutions? And there are many solutions in this field. So could you explain how this is reusing and improving what already exists? Okay, so uh, I have experienced the Brazilian health system, and here in Brazil, especially in uh, public emergency care, that are called UPAs, they have this triage system that is done by a nurse once the patient gets there. We, uh, we adapted the system, we use the same parameters, uh, so that we can pre-triage the patients, and the nurse can uh, just do the, the measuring blood pressure and ox oxygen saturation, that, that stuff that requires the equipment. Thank Can you. I make a question as well? Yes. Um, I would like to know how this survey would uh, be done. Like, is it like an app or is it a web link or how, how is it like? Yes. Okay. It's an app. We are working with, uh, we are thinking about making a chatbot because okay. it's, it's really easier, but it's based on anonymous questions from uh, that are asked in the emergency services. Thank you. And what kind of data privacy provisions or protocols are you going to use? Sorry, excuse me, I couldn't hear. Uh, data privacy? How are you protecting data privacy? So uh, we are making sure that everything is uh, compliant to the local, to the local uh, laws. And it also, when we're working with the government, we have the, the ability to control that more closely. Okay, last question. No? Okay. Yes, uh, I, I have a small doubt. Uh, what steps are you going to do to mitigate that uh, users will actually play the, the survey, the platform, in a way that they will just say things to get ahead of the queue uh, that they oh. okay for it? Okay, we, are, we will work with the, the healthcare facilities so that they can, they can uh, implement that in the community and um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not forward. Uh, make the, uh, recommend that the patients use it so it can grow in the, inside the communities we work in oh. as a habit. Okay, time. Thanks team number 19. We will move to the next one. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, so now it's torn. Uh, it's time to 1431, which is called Universal Health Record. Uh, coming up is Team 13. Who is, who is, is going? Oh, sorry. You. Me. Yeah, don't worry. Hi. So please be ready, the, the next team. It's me. You can start, guys. Okay. Um, you're going to move the slides, right? So uh, next. I think you are sharing the screen. Or not? Yeah. So, I'm not so sharing. Okay. Maria lives in El Alto. She has breast cancer and she needs immediate attention. The only high complexity hospital in El Alto has collapsed. There are no more beds or doctors to attend patients. Wouldn't it be great if there was transparency in the healthcare system to better assign resources and plan suitable healthcare attention? Next. The solution is a dashboard that intuitively shows data about resources available and patients' medical conditions. We will focus in El Alto, Bolivia, where Maria and many other patients with critical conditions live. Next. It consists in a centralized database and a web app that can collect information from all hospitals in one system. Information about the healthcare resources will be uploaded by the hospital administrator, while the patient medical record will be uploaded by the doctor in a computer or phone during the consultation. Both data sets, I mean resources, and epidemiological indicators will be seen by the health authorities in a user-friendly dashboard, which is updated in real time. This leads to better allocation of resources, design of health policies, and of course, more efficient attention for patients. Next. We are helping health authorities take better decisions. We are also helping doctors who will be able to take better care of patients because they will have access to accurate and updated information. And therefore, patients will get better healthcare outcomes. Next. 
To attain our objective, we will first develop the system in the database, in the cloud, which will be connected to a web app. All this information will be reflected in the dashboard. We will take two months and a half to technically develop that solution. And then we will need two weeks to start the trial at one hospital in El Alto. Next. As for the impact, we will focus on five health networks, which consist in eight hospitals, which attend one million patients in El Alto, Bolivia. Next. We will sell this solution to the local government, which will be in charge of implementing it in healthcare facilities or hospitals. It will be a monthly subscription fee. The exact price will be eventually based on cost effectiveness analysis. Next. We will target health authorities directly and we will conduct pilots to gather feedback and make necessary improvements. Next. We have to have our scaled up in the whole city of La Paz and eventually to the rest of Bolivia, we will deploy in the region. Next. This is the most important thing. We are a very diverse team with skills in healthcare management, public policy investment, business innovation, entrepreneurship, software development, and data science. Actually, Douglas, who is the one that started with this idea, has been working as an advisor for the Health Ministry of Bolivia for four years. He knows the problem and he knows that this solution could work. Okay, Next. time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so we, now we have two minutes for questions. Um, I have one question. Are those public or private hospitals you were like aiming to or reach? Both. Both. So, okay. Uh, the same question as before, uh, data privacy. Uh, what is... Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so first data would be encrypted in this database and then government will not get access to all the information, it will be disaggregated data. Anything else? Uh, how do you make this sustainable? Who, pay, who, 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 who pays for what? Okay, the uh, government will pay for the solution, the government will pay a subscription fee, and then the government will implement it in hospitals, public and private, because it will be a requirement. So okay. this starts in El Alto, but it's a national, a national solution? Exactly. The idea is to first start in El Alto. We thought about something very concrete, because hospitals are collapsed there in this city. And then uh, El Alto is part of the Department of La Paz. Then it will go to other cities in the department and eventually to the country. Uh, I, I do have a question about the, the, the user interface side. Uh, is this going to actually be used by the patients themselves? That's it? No. This will be used by the... This will... Uh, okay. So first there's the dashboard where the government will have all the information, but that uh, dashboard is nurtured with data that will be included from the hospital in two different forms. First, the administrator that will include the resources, beds available, respiratory things, resources. And then the doctors during the consultation will include the information of the patient in a form, either in the app that they will have in their phone or either in the computer that they will have in their offices. Time, disagree. Okay. So That's thanks. It. Thanks for your presentation. So we will move to the next team. Yeah, and the next team now is uh, the turn of Team 13, as I mentioned before. So Team 13, please uh, go ahead as soon as it goes. Right. The second, please. Okay. Okay, so please go ahead. Empowerment Start. of the patient. We are the Team 13 and are here today to make the difference. Next slide, please. We know Brazil has one of the highest mortality rates by COVID-19. However, also 135,000 people died due to diabetes last year. Diabetics are passing through a lot. As a risky group, they are too afraid to go on an appointment because of the possibility of being exposed to coronavirus, then facing issues on the scheduled medical appointments and renewing their prescription. Nowadays, since the virtual support services is until now badly comprehensive, sometimes they are still having to leave their homes for medical care. Next slide, please. 
That's why I introduced to you all uh, the D-Health, a platform which will follow the treatment of diabetes patients and their clinical history, making them protagonists of the treatment, allowing a better comprehensive care through the technological support necessary to it. Next slide. And of course, what do you want by doing all this? We want to avoid gaps in the treatment in order to reduce more mortality rates. That's why people shall download and our application and fill out their clinical information. Let's slide. If there is any health problem, an artificial intelligence chatbot asks for symptoms and whether these are associated with diabetes and guides the patient to safe face-to-face -face surfaces according to the regions marked on the map with less crowding or a visual assistance or even signs if the symptoms are not associated with diabetes. It is important to point out that it will certainly minimize the risk of coronavirus exposure when seeking medical care out of home. In addition, as all of the data will be in just one platform, each patient may have their unique QR code available for doctors wanting to read the level of treatment adherence, the glycemic curve, or other clinical relevant information, ever of them filled out daily by the patient. The third tool in our application is the renewal of medical prescription in a digital way. The patient uploads a photo of his old prescription and through their daily information, a doctor may provide a new prescription all online. That's the slide. But how can this platform reach diabetic patients? It will be totally free for everyone. We will certainly need a great public side plan. Also, how can we make money to maintain the app? We intend to earn funds by selling our diverse in space to health companies that are interested in the diabetic public. In addition, we can shape partnerships with philanthropic groups or even universities and governments contributing to researches and public policy. Next slide. If you want to make a difference and help as many diabetes as possible to get healthcare safely and contribute to reducing coronavirus cases in Brazil, please support the health. Thank you so much. Just on time. That's great. Okay, so now we will start with two minutes of questions from the judges. So, Caio, usually, I mean, we always look uh, when, uh, to how this is being designed with the user. Um, who were the, did you have a chance to design this with the users? Yeah, the users will be the main, the main actors in the process. They will fill out everything. And then the, the hospitals and the ambulatory cares will be take that information provided by the patient because, to improve the treatment if, they, if, if there is need to. Uh, I, I have a question related to to this uh, same question. Uh, just there are quite a few, let's say, devices for peri automatic periodical doses that uh, that uh, people can use to treat uh, for the treatment. And um, do you see any way that you can connect to it, uh, IoT, or just so that the person can actually unify these other uh, peripheral devices with with your software? We're, we're thinking to, de to develop a platform that will be able for uh, application, but won't in a website too. And then the, the patient could send the information if, if they want to, I guess it is. Okay. We have time for one more question. Do you have any judges? Ines? I'm fine, thanks. Okay. Okay. All right. We will move to the next team. Thanks, track uh, team B13. Now it's turn of team A1, B1, Media B1. And that will follow, be, that will be followed by team 38. So please prepare. Go ahead, team one, please. Okay. Three, two, one, go. There are around 10 million pregnant women in Latin America every year. Also, nearly 7,000 deaths are during pregnancy and childbirth. My aunt, who lives in rural Peru, is one of them. She suffered many complications with her childbirth due to lack of access to medical care. Next slide. Like Christina said, one out of five babies is dead by 28 days. 10 out of 1,000 babies risk death at first month of life. Next slide, please. 
So post COVID, this situation is going to get worse. The status quo will increase mortality. People are afraid to go to the hospital. Remote areas lack transport. So this is also going to cause a lot of maternal death and preterm birth and problems. Next slide, please. So what are we doing? We're introducing Me Bebe Sano, My Healthy Baby. It's personalized, it's care anywhere, health is wealth and family welfare. Next slide, please. How does it work? So basically we are going to leverage technology and optimize resources for healthy babies. We are going to support the golden years from womb to seven years. We're going to provide a wearable that will have the first, second and third semester panic button and that will do the vitals. There'll be a midwife connection for expectant moms and child. Next slide, please. So what is the structure? The structure is based on hospital, pediatrician, midwife, and expectant mothers. This will be the global structure for supporting the seven years of this child. Next slide, please. So this is a form we will create for the app. The mom will enroll and immediately go to the back office. The back office will assign a midwife. The midwife will start the golden year schedule uh, planning and she will assign the insurance, pediatrician, and work with the hospital. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a golden here schedule. This is a killer app in our technology. We will work with the mom and baby with well baby check, vaccination, family counseling, contraceptive, mental issues, lactation consulting, prenatal care. You name anything from one to seven years. Next slide, please. So how does it all work? The cost is going to be $2 million for the initial rollout in Panama. The revenue is going to be zero for first two years. We will charge $7 per user after the third year, and it will be paid by insurance and government. It's a win-win cost avoidance leading to a healthy econ economy. The first phase, we'll have 50,000 patients from Panama. The target market is 10 million uh, potential moms in Latin America. We expect to reach 1 million by the third year. Next slide, please. The phase one, as I said, will be in Panama. Phase two will be in Peru, Mexico, and Chile. Phase three will be rest of South America. Next slide, please. So we'll have all these collaborations with American and global organizations. We'll, I want to highlight one thing. The midwife will be supported by education through Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic. She will be the partner and the gateway for the mom and the hospital. Next slide, please. So this is a great team. Myself, engineer in Texas, uh, Mr. Ariel in uh, Bogota, Colombia, a PhD professor in healthcare, and uh, Christina, fourth year biomedical student in uh, Lima, Peru. Okay, team. Uh, time, sorry. <laughs> so next, uh, we're going to move to the question, please. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, I have one question. Um, did you think about the scaling up uh, strategies? Like you, you, you were talking about like professional, like human professionals taking care of those mom. And when you tell us like 10 million moms, um, how would, you, would that be scalable? There are 65,000 midwives in South America today. And we are, we are starting with Panama. So based on the 50,000 and based on the 25 to one ratio, we expect to have 2000 midwives part of the plan. And that's the $2 million investment initially. It's a win-win for the mom and the system. Okay, thank you. I Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I have a doubt on, on the implementation side. Uh, you're proposing to take care of, let's say, the child up to from zero, zero years up to seven years, and it's natural that people may get a little bit lax over time and just not input the data. Uh, and just, uh, I was thinking about if you have any strategies to actually engage the users through all this time, and maybe some commercial strategies to have hard incentives for that. Excellent question, Eduardo. The golden schedule, it's named golden because there are golden times in the period of growth of a child. The first three hours is golden because that's when they lactate. The first time they go to the uh, emergency room, it's golden. The vaccination is golden. The schedule is maintained and the mom and the midwife maintain the schedule. There is social media platform in our app. So there is also a mom interaction, everything. So the golden schedule is maintained and they do that on ongoing basis. That's the seven years. After seven years, the healthy baby can join the economy and, and move on. Time. Great question, thank you. Time. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Subu. We will move to the next team. Team B38 with you. Can you please raise your hand for the people who are going to present for this team? Okay. 
Okay, so it's going to be Fernanda Catalan, and coming up will be Team 12. Okay, so Team 38, please go ahead. Can you hear me? You can start now, yeah. That, I think that's not our presentation. This is not? No, actually we're from track B. Ahorita le toca al equipo 38 y después vamos nosotros. Ah, vale, vale, vale. Okay, so team 38, uh, is someone there from team 38? Here, here we are. Uh, well, uh, we are going to stop yeah. and then move back. Relax, relax. go back to the, yeah. to the start, please. Yeah, don't worry. Don't yes. worry. Just a second, please. Okay, so team 38, you will have three minutes for repeat from now. Okay, we are two high school students and one individual engineering student, but we decided to focus on the mental health because we have the experience of feeling lonely during this quarantine. One of our team members was six years old when he was sexually abused. After nine years, after trying to heal himself, he was finally able to access treatment with a specialist. We want to help people so they don't go through this situation. Next slide, please. Does mental health care influence physical health? Of course, Isol isolation makes people more exposed to depression and even more if they live alone, as is the case of 1.7 million Mexicans. And also WHO noted that by 2020, depression is the first cause of disability. Due to the risk of in infection in the health center, it becomes essential to create new ways to manage mental health problems from home. Next, please. So we decided to develop a free application to follow up on the emotional state of the population to prevent and treat mental disease. Due to the social inequality, many sectors of population don't have access to correct treatment for mental illness, which is why this application will be free and available to everyone. That will allow the patient to contact the specialist via chat or video call. Also, we provide the, the opportunity to dialogue with other patients in a forum, and there will be a chat board accessible at all times to ask, to ask questions created by professionals to follow the patient studies. Professionals need have access to patient information safe on a database. In case of symptoms, professionals will give virtual treatment via video call or chat. Next slide, please. We plan to sell the application to companies such as Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Since search histories can be integrated into the app so that an algorithm can detect people at risk of mental illness. Also, governments are potential customers because specialists from the public sector will be able to attend patients through the app. Besides, mental health is an elemental human right, and government must ensure the rights of citizens. This app will become one more instrument for public health, and it will be possible to know the areas in need of a support center. Uh, the app is going to reach to all the population, and if there is someone that has been diagnosed with some symptoms, they, they are going to have a treatment. We are going to start first with the patient that has been waiting for a long time, and if there if there are some cases that have very acute symptoms, they are going to be treated immediately. So we, pl we plan it to sell the application to companies such as Google, Amazon. Okay, team, sorry, time out. So we will move to the questions, please. Judges, any questions? Uh, on the uh, business model, the, you said this would be available for free, so how, uh, how did you make it work? We're trying to sell this application for, to the government, so that could make it a uh, free up for all the sector of the public health. Uh, I will borrow from Irene's uh, previous questions on uh, uh, d data protection, since you are uh, willing to team up with Google and Facebook and Amazon. Uh, that's an important aspect. Maybe we can talk a little bit about, about that. 
Well, we are thinking about encrypting all the database and uh, the information is going to be only accessible for the hospitals and that will make safer the app. Okay, any more questions from the judges? I have one question. Do uh, people reach the app um, like as private persons or is it um, or do they reach it uh, through a, a doctor? Like is it like necessary you have like a, a medical history or can people use it like for free even if they're not like in treatment or something like this? No, it's not necessary to have a medical uh, like recipe or something. Uh, you can download the app if you want. It's also because we have we have uh, we are thinking in reaching all the people that have only depression, like because of the the quarantine. So it's not uh, it's a depression that is for like a short time. You know, maybe after the quarantine is going to end that kind of depression. So it's just to um, join the people. Mm -hmm. Time. Thanks, team. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you, judges, for the Q and A session. Now, with that, it's turn for Team Twelve, Medita, and after that, uh, it will be turn of Team Seven. So please prepare. Can you raise uh, your hand, teammates, uh, for Team Twelve, for us to know who's going to present? Is it? No, Melissa, you just, I'm gonna lower your hand. Fernanda, are you part of Team 12? I think it was Fernanda Catalan and Alejandra Maguel. Yes. All right. So yeah, as, as Benjamin was mentioning, it's just an error in the, in the slides, but you are part of Track B, don't worry. So, okay, thanks. Okay, so please start now. The best way to take care of your health at home. Merida. Next. Do you know a person with diabetes? In the world, more than 463 million people suffer from this disease, and it's estimated that the number of 2045 increases by 55%. That's more than 700 million people. We know that they are a risk population from the pandemic, and that they require continuous medical attention. So our main question is, how can people with diabetes stay safe at home and continue to monitor their health? Next. It's true, we have telemedicine, but for your regular tech exams, you still have to go out. With Medita, we go further. We provide you with medical monitoring so you can do it yourself. Next. And that's not all. We don't use only telemedicine. We use the internet of medical things to complement telemedicine with health monitoring so data can be processed in the cloud and offer you an adequate health track from the comfort and safety of your home. Next. Also, with our mobile app, you can access your results and with Healthor, our chatbot, and your personal health assistant, we can keep track of your vital signs in order to stay on the line. Next. Take control of your health. Our kit is initially provided by our partners who are dedicated to the development of medical equipment. The kit will monitor biomedical parameters relevant to diabetic health, including glucose levels and a rapid blood test. This data will be stored in the cloud to produce dashboards and through analytics generate alerts when something unusual to standard parameters are detected, allowing the doctor to review them and provide you with good care. Next. We integrate the latest technology in a modular, scalable, and comprehensive platform with IOMT, data analytics, telemedicine, and cloud platform. With the integration of these technologies, our goal is to reduce the saturation of hospitals in 3% and also the premature death with preventing monitoring in 3%. Next. This is the ideal and innovation opportunity for hospitals, our potential clients, and the comfort and safety for our users, patients. Next. Our potential allies will provide the necessary medical device to develop our medical kit as soon as we can, for a start, and then start developing our own device. Next. How do we monetize? The service is sold to the hospital, who can download the app for free and pay for the kit and the delivery of it to the patient. The cost of this service, on average, will be $323.97 for the first time, and we will add a profit of 15%. Next. The world evolves. We will trace the path. Next. Merita, stay safe. 
we take care of you at home. That's it. Okay. Fernanda, gracias. Yes. Um, what would be the time to market and how do you uh, ensure scalability if in addition to software you are also uh, you need to uh, supply the actual devices? Yes, so first, um, what was your first question, sorry? The time to market. Devices? The time to market, uh, it will be as soon as we get in touch with our allies. So the allies are already, um, we know them. So the, the thing is that we can ask for them the device for the medical kit and start developing our own medical kit in parallel. So the, the start, they already have the device. So they are already approved by the FDA. So we can start as soon as they can give us uh, the device. Mm -hmm and developing the app also. So it will be like uh, as maybe a six month, like uh, really hard working or maybe less. I don't have the experience to say that because I haven't programmed. Uh, I have a quick question uh, developing on, on this. Is just, have you thought about alternative strategies to increase the impact or try to get this product to the, 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 the largest amount of people you can? I mean, it, it's a pricey product in the end. I don't get the, the, the question, sorry. Uh, the, the question is, it, it, it's, it's like, um, it, it's a pricey product that not that many people in Latin America will be able to afford if you have thought about like strategies to team up with uh, government or other, yes. you know, just... Yes, well, the idea is that the hospital have to pay for the device and then uh, the hospital, uh, um, tells the people how much the people have to pay for this service. So actually we don't see the, the how much are they going to, to tell the people this, this is going to cost, but the hospital has to buy the device. The app is free for the people. So that will be like the, the, the cost. Okay, team, thanks. All right, thank you. It's now the turn of Team 7 for CARE. So please, guys, can you raise your hand for the people who's presenting? It's going to be Ana Cristina Castillo and Sebastián Asensio, right? So and coming up after Team 7 is going to be Team 9. So for CARE, please go ahead um, now. OK. So next slide. Every day, thousands of people in Latin America visit primary health centers for common illness, as well as to receive prescriptions or withdraw medications. This produces a high number of people in these rooms, promoting that the patient must wait a long time before attention, generating discomfort in them. Next slide. From before the pandemic to the present day, these acts have not ceased allowing unavoidable infections due to misinformation and, of course, the need for care. Next slide. But how can we solve this? If we consider the online population of the different Latin American countries, we realize that there is a great potential for the implementation of inclusive technology. Next slide. This is why joining two concepts, an application that informs people about health and includes remote medical consultation, and another, and another that applies supervised machine learning, specifically the decision tree model to predict diseases through inputs made by the patient, is that we have thought of BDI. Next slide. How risky is for you and your family to go to the doctor in this pandemic? BDI offers a 3D algorithm created to predict common diseases and protect the user security. This avoids patients visiting prim primary healthcare systems, which are already collapsed by the high demand of their services. This app cap is capable of being replicable and scalable across Latin American countries. Next, please. For this project, this project consists in of five stages of implementation, but we're going to focus in the first three months, in the first three stages. Informatic and disease predictor and application incorporating use and differentiation, educational gains for children users, medical consultation, 
her recommendations to adults, and also a schedule hours for medical consultations in video conferences. Next, please. Our business model for this first three months are the implementation of publicity and partnership with a communication companies and increase the project to work with sponsors in the nations. Next, please. BTI promote a reduction in COVID-19 infections, expanding it to use to Latin America during and after the pandemic. BTI teams gives this solution for a more accessible health. Next, please. This is the BTI team. Thank you so much. for this presentation. It was great. So now it's time for judges' questions. Um, how is this different from the telemedicine apps that uh, exist? We want to include um, a user like Netflix menu. So child and adults can access to different, uh, different options of telemedicine. For children, we want to include interactive games that can teach them how to watch her, their hands or how to use correctly a face mask. And for adults, we want to implement the consultation for the entire family. So they can register um, their kids and make the predictions of diseases, the common diseases from them. So if the prediction leads to um, a medical consultation, they can access with this. Thank you. I have a, another question, but I, I want to let, 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 let uh, Sergio or Ines uh, go ahead. I, I just, it wasn't so clear for me. Um, how would this information be brought to the, to the users? Is it like a, a consultation? Is it like a psychoeducational um, um, text or video or what is, what is the format of the material there? The, it's going to be an app that can, lead to, uh, can have an option of prediction of diseases. This prediction is going to, make, is going to receive input from, from the patient in a, in a ch chatbot like a model. Okay, but you talked like about Netflix, like a menu. Like this menu is, has information, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. It's going to have um, a Netflix like um, menu, yeah, like uh, different users, and these users is going to lead to different options. Okay. And included, and the chat box is included in this option. Okay. Okay. Do you have any other we, question, judges? We no. don't have more time. <laughs> okay. <Thank laughs> well, just, some, yeah, just some time. Thanks, thank you, Tim. Benjamin. So with that, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, it's now the turn of team nine, which will be followed by team number two. So guys from team nine, can you please raise your hand? To let us know who's presenting. Bernie uh, um, is with her hand raises. Bernie, are you presenting? I am, um, oh, I couldn't unmute it here. Ah, here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> am I, am I like audible right now? Yeah, we can yeah. hear okay, you. Already. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, oh. thank you. So, good afternoon, we're the bloody problem. Next, please. Every three seconds, someone needs blood. In three, three minutes, 60 people will need blood. And in an hour, 1,200. If there's something that coronavirus has shown us, it's that we are very fragile and there's no guarantee that we'll be healthy tomorrow. But we've become so afraid that we've actually worsened an already existing problem, which is blood bank shortages, because we're so afraid to leave our homes. Next, please. In fact, in Latin, oh, the, the following one. In fact, in Latin America alone, blood donations during COVID have been reduced by 20% in Argentina, 50% in Chile, and 88% in Mexico. Next. So, the question is, how can we address the increasing shortage of Latin American blood donations in this COVID-19 crisis? Because campaigns have been launched, but volunteers are scarce because people are afraid. Next. 
that companies focusing on medical attention at home are delivering services in these countries. In Colombia, for example, one doctor can visit up to 10 patients per day in houses with four people on average to perform routine checkups and physical therapy and organize these through a home, uh, an application. Appointments will last around 30 minutes, which will be the time needed to get blood donations. And each donation can save up to three lives. Next, please. We developed a logistics model called Red Covida, where hospitals and blood banks can partner with their, these companies to collect blood safely at home during the pandemic. Users will be the don donors and transfusion patients and the clients of hospitals and blood banks. Donors will need to, next please to open the company's phone application to which an icon would be added to redirect them to our API, next please, to send the healthcare professional the required information. So the value for the client and increase blood supply. And for the user, solidarity and empathy, which will be key to address this pandemic and future challenges to come. And the advantages, it's a simple practical model for all parties involved that takes advantage of an already existing and growing um, network in the pandemic. The business model is B2B and B2G and would involve a fee per business to encourage home healthcare. And with a scalable model like this, if only one healthcare professional per day drew blood from two people per house with 90 appointments in the month and 180 hospitals in Chile would be supplied, thus saving 540 lives. As we can see, there is a huge challenge that is coming towards us, but we need to cooperate together to move forward. So the question is, would you want to save more lives? If so, please, next, and next. Two more, okay, that one. Come join us. We're a multidisciplinary team, international, with three bioengineers, one management engineer, one industrial engineer, and one electronics engineer. And we're always looking to broaden our horizons. Thank you. Great, team, just on time. So now is the time for the question from the judges. I think I might have spoken too fast. Oh, okay. Hey, can yes. you give us like some, I, I love the fact that you are, uh, you've analyzed the ecosystem and you're gonna kind of partner to do it B2B. Can you give us examples of the B2B partners? Well, for example, there are many, we looked actually into uh, several private companies in Peru, in Colombia, in Brazil, and in Argentina. One of them, the name was Adam. In Colombia, they are there. They've been working since 19 the 1970s already in Colombia, and they actually reach many different regions in Colombia, especially in the city of Bogota. So that's actually one partner that we're very interested into looking, because of their experience already in, in the years they've been working. They they actually have physical therapy. They um, have treatment of chronic conditions for home for patients at home, and also medical appointments. Another question? Um, would you need any, what's the time to market? Would you need any authorization or any approval by government for, to do this? That's an interesting question. And I guess it depends on where we start, what niche we started with. Because for example, um, we thought about reaching, for example, we thought about um, Colombia's one case, but for example, in Chile, there are also other companies um, and for example, the, to try an initial proof of concept to say, um, there are hospitals like the FARC who are very interested in studying the, and now all the, the, the studies that are going on with plasma with, with, to treat coronavirus, right? So that was one proof of concept that we were looking into, a potential idea to test how this would look into. And in that case, probably since there would be many uh, ages that would be many many institutions that would be um, interested in this study for example um or in this project initially in that case we would need probably um some type oh, of relationship with the government okay time <laughs> thanks bernie thank you thank you very much guys uh now it's time for team two to present can you please raise your hand guys i can see divya I guess you're going to present alone. Yeah. So, perfect. So please go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. We're Emojicope, and we want you to consider how many of your grannies are alone right now because of the pandemic. Um, your life is bigger than your fear. That's what my grandmother says. She is a 65-year-old lady who suffered a stroke two days ago, and now she can't move half her body. She felt the symptoms two days ago, but teleconsulting, it was too complicated for her to understand. 
even more now that she's on her own. She was afraid of getting infected with COVID, so she preferred not to consult the ER. But she still sent that daily message on WhatsApp instead. Your life is bigger than your fear. Like my grandmother, 71 million people of the Latin American uh, community are alone in this vulnerable condition. And even though COVID time has taught us the importance of the advances of technology to keep the world moving, 11% of the Latin American population still struggle with learning new technology. Oh, continue please. Uh, next, please. Uh, next. Sorry about that. Uh, we want to bring healthcare attention uh, to these elderly people who don't necessarily have these tech skills using WhatsApp, something that most of them use the most. Next. Um, during, the re during the research, we want to take the opportunity to adapt the capabilities that they already have and really um, take away unnecessary exposure in hospitals and waiting rooms. Next. So this is Emojicope, a universal language that connects people to the right resources they need. Next. It can focus on um, helping redirecting to the emergency department. Next. Oh, God. Um, connecting to the right resource that's safe for them in their area. Next. Uh, having an easy referral to the safe medical resource. Next. And since this population is known to share a lot of fake information, we want to make sure we connect them with reliable resources from governments. Next. Um, through our research, we saw that it is feasible. Um, these are just a few steps, but by addressing all these things like privacy regulations and getting partners, we saw that since this app already exists, we can implement it easily. Next. Our impact, we, we've seen there's a lot of excess moral, mortality um, is a big problem. Latin American countries don't necessarily have the data to show this, but seeing what the effects are of COVID in the other parts of the world, we want to help reduce the non-COVID related deaths, especially by helping our elderly population um, get to the right resources, encouraging them to go. Next. Your life is bigger than your fear. Uh, next. So this is our team. We're very diverse from design, from Android development, sociology, environmental science and physician. And we've, we've thought about this, but with you, we can make it all possible. Next. Uh, thank you guys for your time. This is Emoji Cove. And yeah. Time team, just on time. So right. let's go to for that questions, judges. I have one. If you want to start, uh, Ren. Yeah. No. Okay. So uh, 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 this is a very interesting uh, concept. I mean, uh, there has been like an over digitalization of, of everything for elderly people that might have been overwhelming. You have to do everything online now. You have to order food online. Everything's online uh, out of nowhere, and making it easier. It's it's interesting, but at the same time, uh, I mean. This whole process is still generates some anxiety, uh, you know, and, and how does your, like, the, your concept actually approach this, let's say, anxiety aspect of, of, of stuff, if it does it at all? It doesn't matter if it doesn't, just curious about it. Yeah. I, our reasoning behind it was instead of trying to introduce new technologies, um, which was the frustrating part we saw through our research, which we need to research more about. We would just be integrating something that they were familiar with, like using the emojis on WhatsApp instead. So at least try to minimize the anxiety of using a new technology to do another thing that's already anxiety inducing, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Divya, I, it, it wasn't clear. Um, so the, the user is clear, but, but who is in the middle? Who do you partner with? Uh, can you explain better? Mm -hmm. um, so we imagine partnering with um, NGOs or the government to implement this too. They would need to pay just for the development of the emoticon system, essentially. And um, we chose to do WhatsApp since many of these users already used it and saw a free app already. Yes, uh, I would like to add something. Uh, okay, yeah. time. 
Um, <laughs> Sorry, guys. But Thank you. five minutes. Thank you, guys. So now it's time for Team 43, COVID-5, to, to present. Uh, and coming up will be Team 39. So for Team 43, uh, I guess that Simon and Anna C are going to present. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Perfect. So go ahead, please. Hello, everyone. We are COVID Pi. Next, please. Have you ever suffered pain because of bad postures while working or studying? I guess yes. With the appearance of COVID-19 and the application of quarantine, the virtualization of work, education, and business starts. Let's see the statistics in Latin America. At the beginning of the year, just a 12% of people was working remotely, and at the end of March, it turns into 48%. What are the consequences of remote work? One of them is an increase in postural disease, like carpal tunnel syndrome. It affects hand and words. In the US, over 5 million of workers are affected by it. Uh, talking about money, the medical annual cost of the treatment is greater than the total tourist income of Peru. Next, please. The solution we offer is HandPi. It's not a routine, it's a game. HandPi is a mobile app to exercise and rehabilitate hand. But why is it unique? We treat the disease playing a game. Video games not only entertain us, they can also help to solve problems in a funny way. Our app is supported by therapies, making it reliable and safe. How we can do it? Just with a phone. Just we need the camera of our smartphones. It will be enough because we use augmented reality. Next, please. How does it work? One guy has pain in the wrist after a long period using the cable. He can use hand pie to feel better. We provide information to prevent postural disease and gains to the treatment. He will feel really motivated to do it. Simon. Next, please. One of the challenges tracks be is fearing and infection. People avoid entering of the health system and accessing care, even for routine needs based on, on this. We propose education to clarify the doubt of people who normally feel fear due to the misinformation of their pain using credit contact. Next, please. Our development is based on the use of communication so that users do not see it like an obligation. They will see it like a recreational space where, in addition to interact with informative material about COVID and other pathologies, like option one, they can, in option two, carry up interactive experience, especially designed for the treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome using official medical treatment protocols. Next, please. For our business model, we will capture our customers over the internet. Our clients are people who suffer pain due to their body posture. They will pay a monthly fee so they can have used the game. This APP will can grant including more advanced levels focusing on the other parts of the body. Next, please. Our team is made up for professionals from both medicine and programming. We have created a game to exercise, to educate and rehabilitate the hands of people using augmented reality and they don't have to go to the hospital for therapy. Time, now, and Time Simon. So we, we will move to the question from the judges. All right. Um, I have a question, a basic one. Um, how do you think is this problem like new for this situation now? Is it, it, it seems to me more like something we always had a little bit like because of working uh, in, in, in the office and, and long hours. Is this like more uh, a bigger problem right now or? Yeah, uh, like you can see, um, there is a, a very great important uh, growth of the people that is using tel remotely working in the second graphic you can see like in all continents this level half duplicate on on the better of the case um, 
and the cost for healthy system is really up. I think well, we think that this will be a great solution that will be better for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, I, I do have one question about your gamification strategy, which is a good and, and popular strategy right now. But uh, why is your game going to be compelling? Why it's going to be interesting? Just like you know, a Netflix show. Why are you going to watch a specific uh, TV show? Let's say. Uh, or specific for the car carpal syndrome, that is that is a problem in the hands. You can use uh, dynamics like fishing or, or moving objects or using a, a magic berry for exercise your hand, or you can use your your hand to for move. Um, target about a, a 3D puzzle. Uh, there's a lot of strategies, but all this will be based on official protocols, medicals for each pathology. Okay, time team. Thanks for your presentation. It was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Anasia and Simon. Uh, it's now the time for Team 39 to present. Uh, it's healthcare on the, well, I can see, but team 39, uh, which will be follow up by team number 10. So guys, please raise your hand. The one from team 39, it's gonna Hi. be Sebastian Palacio. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. But, uh, can you fix your ma your microphone? It's too loud? Yeah, it's it sounds yeah, too, too loud. loud. Please. Yes, excuse me. Now? Mm, try to... Still a little bit loud. Yeah, it's... Uh, there? Loud. There, it's better? It's a yeah. little better. Yeah, there. Better. you can watch Okay, ahead. thank you. Thank you. So, next please. 18% of elderly people over 80 years old infected with COVID-19 died due to the virus, which means they are the most vulnerable of all the existing population. Next. They're also the ones that most frequently assist to the hospitals for simple appointments. Next, please. The, these senior citizens may be exposed to the virus. Uh, uh, there, the seniors may be exposed to the virus and can get infected. Thanks to the increase of infections and the lockdowns promoted by governments, the healthcare systems are affected economically. Next. To help mitigate the damage caused by this phenomenon, we present to you Health Truck. Thanks to Health Truck, now it is possible to provide to the most vulnerable ones on site medical attention and keep them safe. Next. Health Truck is a mobile doctor's office uh, provided with necessary medical equipment and a clinical physician to deliver rutinary appointments at home. We also offer services of telemedicine for more specific medical appointments. Next, please. Our values, next, sorry. Our value proposals are providing the most vulnerable on-site medical attention. Next, decreasing numbers of patients in hospitals. Next, guaranteeing incomes to hospitals despite the, the pandemic crisis. Next, please. Health truck is built with shipping containers, making it attachable to any simple truck available. Comfortable to drive through dense and populated cities around the globe and easy to park at any spot. Next, please. Our primary target, targets are health insurance companies, private hospitals, and public services that are used to provide these kinds of services. Next, next please. Since our final uh, users are senior citizens, there is a market of over 960 million people around the globe. Our first targets belong, uh, belonging to these markets are Argentina and Peru, whose senior populations are, is over eight and a half million people. Then we can continue with the rest of Latin America. Next, please. There are over 85 million people older than 60 years old currently living in Latin America and the Caribbean. And by the end of the year uh, 2050, uh, it is estimated to grow up to 200 million. Next, please. After talking to different companies that work with containers, uh, conditioning, and um, container conditioning, uh, 
containing condition, we estimated the cost uh, of the of implementing these units is up to uh, thirty thousand per unit, and the revenues through rental can be up to three thousand. Next, please. Our team is composed uh, by Peruvian and Argentinian members to, of different areas that are fit and committed to mitigate the damage caused by the COVID pandemic crisis. Time. Next, please. Okay, thank you. That's it. Let's move to the questions. So, uh, do you have a partner that you could prove this concept with? Partner? Well, uh, there are many cases in nursing homes that are solicited in the, these kind of services, and there are many clinics uh, that want to have, like, uh, they want to increase sales, but they can't due to the fear of people that can go to the uh, to the hospital, elder people primarily. Um, what type of health workers would be in that truck? I, I wasn't clear primarily, uh, well, a uh, simple health, uh, rutinary, for example, vital signs, checking, x-ray diagnosis, blood extraction and analysis. Yeah, uh, no, no, just the professionals, like who would be there like to... Ah, to... Just, just a clinical physician that is capable of doing all those stuff, but there is also a connection with other doctors through a smart TV screen uh, in case they are uh, any, in case uh, the patient needs uh, more specific attention. For example, with a cardiologist or mm -hmm. you know, anybody else. It's a system to facilitate so the access of a telemedicine. It would be possible to put like, um, maybe not a clinician in there, but um, having him on a screen, for example, and just having yeah, nurses but there. The problem is that you need, if, for example, if you need to to, uh, to perform blood extraction, you need like for it to complete to be okay with the regulations in, uh, in Latin America. You need to have a clinical physician to perform all those tasks. Okay. How do you integrate all the telemedicine tools that already exist into this model? Well, just with a, a smart TV. Fortunately, technology facilitates everything. Um, the hospitals work with, many hospitals nowadays work with like platforms that can uh, co uh, connect with patients uh, via internet uh, like, uh, and can perform the meetings just with a smart screen and the, uh, uh, with the companion of a clinical physician. Okay, time. Thanks, Tim. So, Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Let me just transition to the next slides. So now it's the turn of team number 10. Uh, can you please raise your hand, guys? Is it Antonio Feregrino? It's already right. Yep. Okay, perfect. So, and coming up will be team number 100. Okay, so Antonia, please go ahead. You please can start now. think about this image. Now, please think about this image. Have you ever really imagined what's going to happen when COVID-19 vaccine becomes available around the world? How are we going to operate its application and supply to its final user. Well, when available, this is going to be one of the medi biggest medical displacements in history. Next, please. But what if I told you that a vaccine supply chain is weak and vulnerable? According to UNICEF, 60% of vaccines are wasted cold chain, fake vaccines, lack of data and corruption. Next, please. My name is Jose Antonio Feregrino and I belong to Team BO10 and our solution is to provide routine immunization through blockchain. This will provide us traceability, real-time data, fairness and transparency. It will be an unbreakable against corruption. Next, please. So how are we going to do it? First, in the first phase, vaccines will have a unique QR code since its origin. On the second phase, we will be scanning vaccines 
on each step of its supply. We will be uploading real-time data like its location, temperature, and status. At the third phase, we will scan the vaccine and we will relate it to its final user through a registration of its biometrics and GPS location. Next, please. This will require a lot of data to be processed, but there are already existing a lot of uh, initiatives like this one from IBM, in which uh, it has more than hundreds and thousands of, of volunteers in which you donate your uh, devices per computer power uh, to help process uh, huge quantities of data. Next, please. Our team is confirmed by uh, medics who are very passionate uh, they've been working on projects like eradicating papilloma humanos in Peru and uh, a current doctor serving in Guadalajara. I've been working in process design and optimi optimization in Asia and Mexico. Next, please. So you might be thinking why uh, we should do this if the vaccine doesn't already exist. Well, this is going to be a problem that's going to come sooner or later. That's exactly why we have a unique time frame, time frame to prepare ourselves. So when the challenge comes, we will shall and we will be ready to provide vaccines with traceability, fairness and transparency that will save people's lives. Thank you so much. Just on time, great team. So, yeah. judges. Thank you. Thank you, this is great. Um, you. Uh, could you give us an idea of the, of the cost and, 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 and who would you, uh, if, if this is B2B or this is, uh, how would you deploy the solution? This will be a B2B. Uh, actually, we're not inventing uh, any technology. We are basing ourselves on technologies that are already used, uh, mostly in, in, in companies like Amazon, DHL, and we are focusing it on this common purpose. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the cost is, is going to be developing the app uh, and, and all the development of the unique QR codes, it's printing and uh, that's it. That's mostly because also the collaboration on the processing of data with IBM, it's something that people do it as, as volunteers, so. Another questions? Uh, another question? <laughs> Come on, we have one, 50 seconds more. I, I was also just asking myself as well about the business model, but it got clearer to me now. Mm -hmm. Eduardo, thank you. Uh, no, I don't have any questions for this. Great. Well, Gracias. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now Gracias. it's... Now it's turn off team 100, uh, which will be then followed by team number three. Uh, can you please raise your hand, people from team 100? Can you hear us, guys? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, can you raise your ah? Can you raise your hand? people from Team 100 to know who's going to present? Or can you unmute yourselves? Benjamin, do you have the list of the names of the people from this team? From this, this team yeah, was Jean-Paul. Yeah, yeah, Jean is team 100 or team 3? Uh, 100. 100. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Mm, okay, uh, let me check. But this was the Ampol team, and I can see here, and also the. Okay, so we can move to the next team. I, I think they will not present their pitch. All right, perfect. So we will move on. Okay, yes. Hey, okay. Now, team three, right, Diana? Yes, team three. Okay, perfect. So please, uh, ah, and then it will be followed by team number 18. 
Okay, so please go ahead, Diana. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Imagine being one among the 11 million pregnant women in Latin America when everybody's focused on a pandemic. Hi, we are team three with Nata Lab. Next, maternal mortality is high. Currently, it is hard to obtain data, but more than ever, expecting moms are concerned about attending hospitals and their prenatal care has been reduced by a 40%. Next. We created a survey to test our hypothesis, and the moms confirmed they are scared of exposing themselves to the virus at hospitals. A testimony states that the professionals just want to end the consultation as soon as possible. Next. We know it is important for pregnant women to have periodical control. Almost all of us in the team relate with this challenge. My parents are prenatal and neonatal MDs, and they are extremely worried with providing a quality service without compromising the mother's risk. That is why we decided to team up and create a solution. Next. Natal App is a super app designed to track pregnancy and access medical services. We developed an affordable subscription service which also benefits low-income pregnant women. Next. We offer the mom a mobile application which provides a classic mode with assistance by health professionals, educational material, pregnancy calendar, and a track of clinical results. Also, each mom could upgrade to a new premium subscription, which adds more value to her experience by consultations with specialists, nutritional plans, and interactive, interactive courses, basically all in one. Next. For the health professionals, we offer a prenatal checkup website for appointments, answer requests, and organization. The web platform could potentially be used by NGOs to get in contact with pregnant women in risk populations. Next, please. We have two revenue streams. We will charge private clinics with an annual fee and monthly classic or premium subscription per month. Each mom can also help by upgrading. For two premium subscriptions, we also donate one to a mom in financial issues. Next, Needle App offers an integrative solution. The hospital will have saving logistics and risk while they increase the service quality during crisis time. For the moms, we bet for integral assistance while reducing the risk. The professionals will have a complete access to data and requests. There are some telemedicine apps on the market, but our app is the one that integrates all of these services at one point. Next. Running a pilot in three clinics, we could achieve enough money to cover the first investment. And the journey doesn't end here. We want to keep up our model dynamic for further innovations in Latin America. Next. Due to COVID-19, 4% of expecting mothers suffer a critical condition. Let's protect them with integral solutions. Finally, our team shows that diversity and motivation can be the engine for great ideas. Thank you. Hey, let's Gracias, go with Diana. the questions. In, in, in area, we tried something like this in Haiti and we failed. So <laughs> part of it was because the, the health system didn't, was not ready. So the delivery system that you're counting on once you give the recommendation or give access is not there. How would you deal with this? How would we, oh, we were actually also um, approaching like several medical students or other organizations that could help us with this. That's why we're targeting many NGOs that can uh, also provide them like the midwife services and also other types of integrative solutions that can be part of uh, this app. Also, I would like to add that I'm from the same group. I would like to add that we are going to sell the app to the private hospitals, right? So the amount we are getting from the private hospitals, we will give that money to the public sector. So that's our point. So okay. the private hospitals will help to implement this in the public sector? Yeah, no. the money we're going to gain from the private hospitals that we will be realizing in the public sector to help the people in need. So it's a chain sort of thing. Okay. And how would like the hospitals, like I, I understand the end of the users, like the pregnant women in the yeah. app. And how would that be like those data and, and things, how would they be like presented or accessible on, on, on the hospital side? Like, uh, so we will have a partnership with the pregnant women, they will have a partnership with the hospitals also. So yeah. the, no. our first target is private hospitals, our second target is pregnant women. So we yes. will have both of them. So the hospitals would like access those data of those women 
on the app as well. Yeah, yeah. Women will be providing the data. She will be connected to the doctors online. She will be provided much more information. Like data will include track of the pregnancy from music and entertainment for the pregnant women, temperature check, blood pressure, and she will be consulted by the gynecologist of the other professionals here. Time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Now it's turn of team 18, uh, which will be followed by team 16. So again, guys, can you please raise your hand? You know who's presenting? I can oh, see- I have already- uh, Federico Granado, right? Yes. Juan, Juan Franco Canepa, you have your hand raised. Are you presenting as well? No, right? Okay, perfect. So Federico, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Next slide. Ah, thank you. Here's the harsh reality. At the moment, more than 8 million COVID-19 cases have been confirmed worldwide. 25% of these cases correspond to health workers, and this number will double in the upcoming months. Next, please. As you may know, the World Health Organization recommends N95 masks for health professionals. Nevertheless, this har the harsh economic situation in Latin America and the high PPE costs have led to a shortage in these masks. Next, please. Even though these masks should be replaced within a day, 87% of the professionals in the USA are forced to reuse them, increasing their chances of contagion. Next, please. Our solution uses UVC to decontaminate PPE, the air, and the surfaces of hospitals. Our implementation plan for PPE decontamination covers this problem at the short term, but we've also thought about the mid and the long term, as the COVID-19 virus has come here to stay, in addition to other microorganisms. Next, please. For the short term, we have designed a UVC prototype device that can decontaminate 12 N95 masks in only five minutes, with a cost of less than $800, the investment in the device can be recovered in only three days. As you can see, our solution is viable, fast, and cost-effective. By using this device, hospital can save a lot of money and become more environmentally friendly. Next, please. In the midterm, we plan to develop air decontaminating devices that will sanitize hospital air using UVC, which I, uh, this idea has, has already been implemented. In the long term, well, I, I mean for, by other companies, in the long term, we will develop an autonomous robot equipped with UVC and image processing capabilities to decontaminate hospital spaces and evaluate the effectivity of decontamination. Next, please. In the last two columns of this table, you can see that, that the savings that only three countries from Latin America would get from the implementation of our short-term device. We've already identified some companies in Latin America that will be able to help us to produce and distribute the PPE decontaminating device in a short amount of time, as they've already developed a very similar device that can be produced easily and at a similar low cost. So we only need this support as some funds to start working tomorrow. Next, please. I'd like to thank my team, very inter interdisciplinary team, and the mentors that supported this project for making this possible. Thank you very much. Just on time. Thank you. Uh, a the time to market and the price point. Could you clarify a bit more? Okay, the, the, the cost of the device, the short-term device? Or? Yes. Ah, okay, uh, well, it's uh, of $753 per, uh, per, uh, per each device. That is very similar to the ones that, that I just mentioned of the company we'd like to work with. And, and the time to market, so this already exists. What is the innovation there? Okay, well, the innovation, uh, well, we didn't focus uh, that much in the innovation, although we proposed uh, a model that could be, uh, implement, uh, could be fabricated with, uh, by other companies. But uh, our value is in that we attack the short-term problem of the, the contamination of PPEs. Uh, by my pairing, the pairing of with these companies. Uh, one of these companies uh, is already gathering funds to, 
uh, be able to donate a lot of these machines. So we, by pairing with them, we could distribute them to the, the countries that need it the most. And from that, we would um, uh, implement the other uh, alternatives from the, for the mid and the long term. So it's little by little, focusing on what is the problem right now. Uh, I, have, I have a question about the cost benefit analysis that you did before. Uh, it might be useful to actually uh, make a difference in cost per day of use of mask, maybe. Uh, just because I, I didn't quite uh, grasp what was, let's say, the percentage or the magnitude of, of difference of cost. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, you mean like the recovery of the, the, the time for the recovery of the inversion or? The time for reco recovery or uh, looking for, yes, and yeah, the time for recovery could be a way of looking at it as well. Oh, okay. Well, our model uh, sterilizes uh, 12 masks uh, per each use. So in a small hospital of 20 people, if you um, use it uh, per one day, uh, you could sterilize 24 masks. And uh, uh, so in three days, uh, you, you would be sterilizing. Time. Sorry, Federico, but we are run out of time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Later, we can discuss. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it's time for the next team, which is team number 16 which will be followed by team number six. So please, team, from team number 16, uh, can you please raise your hand, guys? Let me just check. Probably it's the same situation as the previous team. Yeah, it was. So uh, guys from team number six, can you please raise your hand? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so at you, right? Yes. Perfect. Uh, in order to be fair, do you want to have a few seconds uh, to prepare because you didn't have the five minutes or it's okay? Uh, it's okay. We're prepared. All right. Let's perfect. Go for this. perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so one of our team members, grandmother, is suffering from cancer and she has been devoid of chemo from the last three months. Can we do something about it? So here we are, a diverse team of individuals from Peru, Mexico, and India, with a background in healthcare strategy, analytics, and finance. And something that really binds us is a common passion for healthcare and to impact change in emerging markets where our loved ones are suffering from COVID. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, while uh, there are just 7,000 uh, deaths per week due to COVID patients in Peru, there are 45,000 deaths per week due to non-COVID diseases. So the question on a patient's mind is, first, whether they can go to hospitals or will it expose them to a much higher risk of contracting COVID? And if they go, then when and where? So this is precisely the pro problem that we are trying to solve. Next slide. Uh, sorry, the previous one, I think. This one. Uh, the previous slide. I think it. Uh, so, our solution is a threefold solution, a triage app through which we can integrate a touch of personalization equipped with data. So, the first uh, thing that we are trying to accomplish is recommend alternative healthcare solutions, uh, that is, virtual home based care, where we can leverage the local community of healthcare uh, professionals in the neighborhood and uh, maybe have some mobile clinics. In phase two, we plan to integrate haptic uh, tech solutions for more sophisticated virtual diagnosis if the pilot is successful. Second, uh, triage based on underlying health conditions using a risk scoring machine learning model. Third, virtual queuing so that only limited number of patients enter the hospital at any given point of time and minimize the risk of contracting uh, COVID. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is uh, just a quick glimpse of how we want to expedite the patient's journey through use of technology. Next slide. Uh, and this is how the interface for the patients will look like, where they can go and book the appointment or uh, go through a screening procedure using the questionnaire. Next slide. Here are some of the data sources that we will deploy to collect data in addition to the screening questionnaire given to patients. Next slide. 
and then uh, we'll come up with a risk scoring model. So here uh, is what how our machine learning model looks like, and um, we'll assign a risk score based on the symptoms that we see in the patient. So for low risk patients, we will recommend a home based care. Uh, and uh, for more critical patients, we will share this machine learning generated output with a back end healthcare professional team. So uh, we will aid medical team to make more informed decision with data. Uh, next slide. So this is another glimpse how the ML uh, output will look like. So next slide. Time. So let's move to the questions. Uh, thanks, Swati. Um, uh, would this be interoperable with um, uh, the other systems if the plan is to roll it out through the public health system? Uh, yes. Uh, so actually, I was coming to that. So we, in terms of a business model, we have two models. One is B2C and B2B. B2C is where we are directly connecting with the patients and the hospital network. And B2B, where we are using all this data for our research purposes, for getting new drugs in the pipeline, and for academic research. So that is how we are planning to roll it out. Sorry, is, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. And, and in terms of, uh, sorry, Eduardo, go ahead. No, no, please, please, please go. I was just going to go to the data privacy part uh, because you, I didn't hear you talk about data privacy. How are you ensuring? Uh, yeah, so we have a solution called, uh, we'll be using PHI uh, integrated with DNI. Uh, so maybe Anirudh can talk a little more about it. He's experienced that. Uh, yeah, so we'll be basically implementing a password for every user who's using it and it'll be corresponding with the DNI number and uh, we'll be following the PHI protocols and not sharing any information of the patient with the government. Thanks. I have okay. a quick question. Oh, time? No, yeah, no, no. Just one, one more question. Okay, I, I have a quick question about the technical uh, part of the solution. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this, uh, this kind of solution has been replicated uh, and successfully replicated and, and developed in other initiatives as well. What is your uh, actual differential from these other already existing, uh, let's say, machine learning models for patient interface? Uh, so we are basically triaging the patient using the risk scoring model. Uh, so as far as we research, there are very few apps and very, uh, in very few countries are using this technology to maybe expedite and triage patients. Uh, so this is how we can prioritize which non-COVID patients should be sent to hospitals. And we'll using, we are using the feature of virtual queuing. So you don't need to go to the hospital till you are allocated a number. And also we'll be tying in the capacity of the hospital so that at a certain given point of time, uh, only a limited number of patients uh, can enter the hospital. So we'll be governing the end-to-end -end patient journey through that. So that's the differential because most of the apps are just doing the initial screening part and just connecting with a healthcare professional. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, but thanks for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Now it's time for team uh, number 41, COVID Health Support. Uh, can you guys please raise your hand to let us know who's presenting? See Are you Julio? There, guys? I see Julio. I think probably Julio was from the previous one. Can you let us yeah, know? Yeah, from Julio? the previous one. Okay, I'll, I'll lower your Thank hand. You. So let me see, probably. Yeah, so it's now time for team 55. Uh, can you let us know who you are, guys, by raising your hand? Hello, guys. From So we will move to the next team, you? Uh, yeah. So there is no, no one from okay. Team 55. Okay. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, we're here. Can you okay. see us? Yeah. Uh, let me Can see. you hear me? Is everything all right? 
Yeah, we can hear you, Leonardo. Uh, so do you need a few seconds to prepare as you didn't have the five minutes or you are all set? Uh, can you give me 30 seconds? Sure, of course. Okay, just give me 30 seconds, that'll be enough. Absolutely. Please let us know as soon as you're ready. Yes, sir. Okay, team, are we ready for okay. the start? Okay. Yes, sir, right, I'm from, ready. Um, no. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're team B55, and we have planned a project we have named Anti-COVID. According to, next, please. Next. According to information provided by Peruvian sources, uh, wait, you skip one. Yeah, is the time coming because I'm kind of tight on time. Yes, go ahead. We'll take this into account, don't worry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so according to information provided by Peruvian sources, more than 50% of non-COVID patients attending to Peruvian hospitals have contracted the pandemic due to the presence of COVID patients. Furthermore, only a very small percentage of COVID patients needs to go to hospitals. Next, please. So our, our problem is that not at risk COVID patients have necessarily seek treatment at hospitals, which consumes physicians' time, exposes non-COVID patients to the pandemic, and prevents them from being attended. Next, please. Our solution to the problem is anti-COVID, a telemedicine cross-platform mobile app for COVID patients that has three core features. Next. First, an intelligent virtual assistant. This assistant receives COVID patients self-reported symptoms, identifies at-risk cases and refers them to urgent care and prescribes medication for routine symptoms, fever, sore muscles, etc. All done with high accuracy. Next. Second, a hotline with medical students. This hotline will connect med students with anxious COVID patients looking for comfort and for mouth to mouth information, such as where to find X medicine, what if I have X disease, will I die tomorrow? <laughs> Next. 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 And third, a social network for COVID patients. This is a network for, of support for patients that can be separated into channels, like Slack, depending on the location and symptoms that the patient reports. Next. 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 This is the way where projects feature impact our community. Intelligent assistance characteristics, providing prescriptions and a personalized diagnosis will keep not only will keep at not at risk COVID patients away from hospitals, allowing other diseases patients to safely visit their doctors. The medical students hotline would support not only COVID patients, but also med students in other practice and experience. And finally, the patient social network will not only provide psychological support for the patients, but also provide collect data based on patient's location and self-reported symptoms, which could prove to be an invaluable source of information for the medical research community. Next. This is our business plan. Our chatbot with machine learning capabilities is an idea that will cost about 10 grand to explore and around $180,000 to perfect. Our hotline will cost about $3,000 for developing the interface and our social network will cost about $5,000 for, develop for developing purposes as well. Next. Our funding sources will include organizations that have been actively fighting the pandemic. We estimate we could get about 50% of our funding from Peruvian government research grants and the rest from the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. Finally, okay, team, our time, time. Sorry, okay, but thank you. we need to move to the questions, please. Yeah, that's okay. I, I have a question. Uh, I don't know what the legal situation in Peru is, but is it like allowed for medical students to attend um, like to to attend those users on the phone so uh, the idea and my group my team can help me if, if they wish here they can chime in um, the idea is that students support like psychologically and just with advice they are not allowed to uh, prescribe they just if, give if a not yeah okay. yeah yeah okay um, Leonardo who are your let's say 
competitors or what's available already that would look like like that looks like this because i've seen other things uh right uh Chueke, you want to chime in uh because we know we have a, a, a lot of competitors but if you if you uh, because telemedicine is so popular, especially at these moments. But if you want specific names, uh, we have done a small research, uh, a small market research. Chueke, do you have names? The more important thing would be to understand why you feel this, you have a strong differentiator to those that are more established. Right. Um, so we, we think the difference here is that although there are uh, many several telemedicine companies, we have not had uh, I would say a single one penetrate correctly in the Latin American uh, environment. Uh, so in that sense, we will be pioneers because we don't actually have telemedicine in Latin America. And uh, not only that, but we need uh, a case-by-case -case review of the app that actually will work in Latin America. And, I've, and, and we think that our three features uh, will exactly provide what uh, Peru is looking for. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now it's time, and is, this is our last presentation. It's time for team number five. So, guys, can you please raise your hand to let us know? I can see Franco Musio. Is that you? Yes, it's me. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, we can hear you. Are you ready? Uh, let me just close this. Yes. Perfect. So, please go ahead. Okay. Next. Meet Sophia. As a pregnant mother, she wants the best care for her child, but due to COVID-19, she's afraid to go to the hospital. She doesn't have internet access. Now she's diagnosed with eclampsia, a serious and fatal condition that is actually man manageable had she gone to her routine checkups. This is a case of a large number of people in Latin America. About 60% of patients have stopped going to hospitals over fear of COVID-19. Almost half of the population still do not have access to the internet, let alone internet-based telemedicine. On patients with chronic conditions such as pregnancy, diabetes, this means worsening health conditions and even death. Developing a solution which is accessible for everyone is therefore crucial. Next. This is where Amigo comes in. Amigo is an all-inclusive chatbot API for patients with chronic conditions. We offer targeted messages to remind patients for hospital visits by assuring its safety. We also aim to reduce overcrowding of patients and the time spent in the hospital waiting room by enabling virtual monitoring, medication reminder, and the virtual appointment reservation. Next. Amigo works by fetching patients' data from hospitals, electronic health record companies, and the government. These stakeholders can choose which patients need our services and upload their information, allowing our API to provide care to them. Next. Our API works by first validating patient information. When it is verified, we will send messages tailored to their needs based on our algorithms. If the patient reports any symptoms, Amigo will recommend and assist the patient to schedule an appointment. Next. Amigo works with SMS and WhatsApp platforms. Illustrated here are three functions of our product offering, symptoms monitoring, checkup reminders, and appointment scheduling. We've also highlighted communication provided to patients about the safeguards in, pla in place at the hospitals to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Next. Based on our analysis, Amigo is more comprehensive compared to other chatbots since we offer a more holistic digital healthcare approach and its, and its wide accessibility. Next. Our business model is a pay-per-use model. We, we, would, we would work with local carriers to negotiate competitive rates per message. Health systems only pay for what is distributed, and most importantly, the patient bear no, bears no cost. Our belief is that this service should not be cost prohibitive to these vulnerable populations. Preventive care is more affordable than an urgent and emer emergent care. With Amigo, Latin America health system can realize a cost saving of, of at least $91 per, per patient. Next. For our pilot, uh, we, would, we, were, we are in contact with a hospital in Chile, ACH, which is a hospital I currently work for. Our next step after this hack hackathon would be to further develop our API to match the hospital needs and finalize collaboration with the hospital. We will then conduct two test runs in the hospital and develop the API in accordance with the feedback before the chatbot's market launch. Funding should be secured from venture capitalists or the government. Next. Our long-term vision for Amigo is to be able to, to help vulnerable patients with other conditions and to triage patients based on their symptoms. Next. Our team has a diverse skill sets, including medicine, public health, business, and AI development. Thank you all for your time. Will you join us today, Amigo? That is all. Hey, gracias, Franco. So, that is your time. Hey, hey, Franco, could you explain the, how, uh, the interoperability and also the, the data privacy? 
yeah, on re regarding on, on, on data privacy, we will follow the API security guidelines. The example, for example, we'll limit the request done for the service, uh, prevent uh, SQL injection, and we'll follow HTTP methods. Uh, on regarding on interoperability, interoperability, I don't know what you were, uh, what your question is targeted to exactly? So you already have a partner at this hospital, which I think is a great step. Um, they might have, they would have their own systems and you may be, so how, how would this? Yeah, uh, yeah, we actually talked with, to this with a, with a mentor, which he, he, uh, he recommended us to, to uh, obviously, uh, like the data cleansing need, needed before the, the, the integration of the, of, the, of the systems. I don't know if, if that's answered the question or, or not. Thanks. Uh, I, I do have a question of the continuous uh, process of engagement of the patient. I mean, the, the idea is, is very compelling. It's very cost efficient. It's very interesting and it has shown to work in various places, but uh, people might, be, might get bored of the bot after a while, after one or two, let's say, uh, wrong answers or doubtful answers. Um, you know, and how do you have alternative strategies to mitigate that? Yeah. Uh, also, we also talked about that with the mentor. Uh, he recommended like first start with maybe just one specialist and, and complement it with a, like, I don't know if it, we're just going to focus on one chronic condition uh, so we can have very thorough and complete answers. So, so the system turns out to be reliable and can, can actually give helpful solutions to the, the people we target. I have no questions. I'm, uh, I'm working for Teenage Health, so I'm happy that we appear there. Is <laughs> <laughs> it cool? And, uh, on the cost and who pays for what, Franco? If you can explain more. Yeah, uh, on 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 the cost, the the, the on the pilot, it would be the, the our, our first client would be the hospital. Uh, regarding uh, what's a platform, for example, we a mentor mentioned. We could, if, if, if we do like a marketing, uh, using marketing 4.0 and just putting our numbers so people can contact, I think it's, it's no cost <laughs> or, or, or really minimum cost. On the other hand, if, if, if we send out messages, we, we just have to apply to the uh, like cost per message by the telcos, which I, I think is around five cents uh, per message. Time. Okay, team, thanks for your presentation. Thank so you. some closing word from David. But from Diego, sorry. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Well, yeah, well, as as we were saying, uh, this was the last presentation. Uh, we thank you so, so, so much. Uh, we really appreciate your commitment during that, the last 48 hours. I know it was demanding, it was hard, but you did it. You did it uh, to this last point of the event. Uh, congratulations. Uh, as I was telling you in the beginning, uh, it's already... Uh, it's already been successful to be here. Uh, if you're here, is the, if, it's because you deserve it. Uh, we really appreciate your hard work, your commitment. Uh, now it's time for you to relax, to wait. We will share more information uh, via the usual sources, which is Slack. Uh, if we, we're gonna also share, we're gonna share us. Can you please mute yourself? So we're going to share a Zoom meeting uh, in a few minutes. Uh, please stay tuned in the Slack channel. Uh, if you have any doubts or if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in, in those channels and we will make our best to answer them. But again, I, I just want to thank you again. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of the organizing team members uh, has any other remarks, uh, Francisca right. or Benjamin. Just to say thanks to, to Ines, Irene, um, Oh, and Diego, <laughs> David, sorry. Diego, <laughs> for, Diego, Diego, Diego. <laughs> I, I have a little mess with the names. So thanks for your help. Uh, and for the participants, remember that we will have the post hackathon. So even if you don't win the prize and, and, the, and the money and the glory, you will have the opportunity to stay engaged with other participants and mentors to really develop your solution. So as Diego, as Diego said, uh, you are all winners and be proud of that. Uh, judges, do you have any closing remarks? I really I, enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you to all. I mean, all the presentations were, were really great. Uh, I mean, really great for 48 hours work and congratulations.
I'm sure some of them are going to become actual uh, uh, things to be implemented and help us get out of COVID. Yeah, I want to thank you as well. Um, I can just imagine like how intense those last uh, hours were for you. Um, it was a very, it was a great pleasure to to see all the solutions, and I think we we have a lot of potential here for um, for this situation. Yeah, I just wanted to say sorry. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. It has been great to collaborate with you, to the judges, the organizing teams mentors everyone this experience has been amazing and given the times that we're living in it's uh, amazing that people would dedicate an entire weekend to make good uh, so thank you and keep doing so i'm very glad that i participated in this experience and i got to interact with you so thank you so much to everyone okay well with that uh, again thank you congratulations uh we will ask you to please leave this uh, room meeting except the judges uh we ask you to please stay for we're gonna provide you with, with some details but please uh, participants uh, help us leaving the room and we'll share any information uh, by slack thank you thank you again Uh, we'll wait a few minutes. I know you're working on, on your thing, judges. So, for the people who are still here, please help us leaving leaving the room. Francisca, can, can you help us creating the breakout room, please? I think it's going to be for the judges and the three of us. Thank you. Okay, judges and Benjamin, uh, please join that breakout room. See you there. Thank you, Francisco. Hey, for, for the rest of you, you can already leave this meeting. We will share a Zoom link for the award ceremony um, that will take place in less than an hour. Thank you.
¿Cómo estás, Diego? Ya me quería Oye, salir del yo... room completo y regresamos acá. <risa> yo también, no, 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 no caché lo que está esperando el Freddy, como que también me perdí con la deliberación. Yo dije como, claro, o sea, van a estar los puntajes y ya está, pues, pero como que no, no cachaba que había que deliberar algo más. Sí, no, yo tampoco. Y, y es que realmente nos dio muy poca información Freddy. Dijo que eso él se encargaba de, de explicárselo ah. a los jueces. Ok. En la última reunión. Pero bueno, me despido también de ti, Benjamín. Muchas gracias por todo. Oye, Diego, o encantado. Hola, Muchas gracias por la ayuda. Estamos hablando por Slack. Chao, por chao. Slack, exacto. Chao. Benja, sorry, ya llegué. Eh, ah, ya se fueron. <risa>